Johnny Cash's interview on Later with Bob Costas on November 7th, 1988 was perhaps the most intimate and honest of his career. Easily the most real talk I ever saw of a man in black give. And, and, and it was a man in black interview. He, 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 told, he pointed out the only time he got caught in, in white on stage, but uh, he uh, really talked about the struggles of his life, and especially with his drug addictions, and uh, you know, he went into detail, went into detail about his father, went into detail about his sobriety that started at the Betty Ford Clinic. Just a great, great, basically non-musical interview with Johnny Cash. Thanks for staying up later. I'm Bob Costas, and we're picking up tonight where we left off with Johnny Cash. You know, I would guess that a lot of people believe that you've spent a long stretch of time in prison because of Folsom Prison Blues and, and going back and doing the, the concerts for prisoners. They do. Yeah, they do. I have people come up and say, um, my brother was with you in Folsom Prison. I say, at the concert? No, doing time. I said, I never, never did time in prison. But I did a lot of concerts in prison, and I wrote Folsom Prison Blues as, you know, a songwriter will have a situation in mind and write about it, his feelings that, about the situation. That's the way I wrote Folsom Prison Blues, as if I were in prison, and how would I feel if I were in prison? Um, and that song pretty well tells how I think I would feel. But I, I, I have to qualify what I said about not being in prison. I have been behind bars. You know, um, in Nevada, when, when you work in the state of Nevada, you have to fill out this long form about your past. In 1975, when I went to work at the Hilton, uh, one of the questions down near the bottom was, have you ever been incarcerated in jail? There's five spaces there that you can put down. I had to use the back of the page because I had seven that came to mind. So, um, well, That's they, enough to make people think I've been in prison, I guess. Disorderly conduct yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah, or? disorderly conduct. Um, I, don't, I don't really remember what the charges were, a lot of them. Uh, one time I was fishing and, uh, and the bank caved in. This was at night in, in the Carson City, Nevada. And I came up under the bank and clawed my way to the top and my clothes were wet, so I took them off and laid down in my car to, with the heater on to get warm and fell asleep. And the next thing I knew, there was this knock at my car window, and it was uh, the badge, and they took me to jail. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a song about one night, and... Uh, what was the charge? Public nudity? I never did know. No, I wasn't charged with anything. No, it wasn't public nudity. I was way out in the woods, and uh, I didn't think there was a soul around for miles. But somebody saw my car and heard it running for hours, and... Uh, to call the police and they came and got me. Well, I had to, uh, I put my clothes on. They had dried out pretty good from the heat in the car, so I put them back on before I went to jail. Um, the other time I was about to tell about was in Starkville, Mississippi, when all I was doing was walking down the sidewalk, um, walking along, whistling and picking flowers. But it was, uh, it was 3 a.m., and the local citizenry in Starkville didn't, want somebody picking the flowers in their yard at 3 a.m. So they called the police and spent the night in jail there. And I wasn't charged then. I don't know what it was for. But you know what? The last time I was in jail was in, in Georgia. And um, I don't remember going to jail. I was on amphetamines and a little of everything then. And uh, he, he let me out the next morning and gave me my money. And the pills back. He said, take them and go and kill yourself if you want to. He said, you can choose whether you live or die. And I threw those pills away, and then I went home and saw. Uh, June and I contacted the Commissioner of Mental Health for the state of Tennessee. That's when I came off of pills the first time, 1967. So uh, it was usually, most always, because of pills or alcohol. Did you believe at one time, if you'd been asked to give odds, that you'd die prematurely? No. Because of your drug abuse? No. No, I didn't. I never thought I would. I should have, I guess. I had every chance to. I came close to it a lot of times, but I never, 
I never thought, of, even at my lowest point, I felt like that that God was, His presence was there, going to pull me through it for something. For some reason, I had to live, and uh, and I did. What was the lowest point? Well, I had quite a few. That uh, that could be different points in the eyes of different people, whether it might be my wife or my son or my daughters or my mother. For me, the lowest point was in. Um, Thanksgiving 1983, when I came back from a tour of Europe, I had, uh, I never did cocaine or, or heroin, or never did shoot up, but I did all every pill they ever made. I was a connoisseur of pills. I went to Europe and did a 14-city tour of one-night stands, and I got back home. I realized I only remembered four cities out of 14. And I had, uh, went into the hospital, had surgery, stomach, and, uh, and was on morphine IV for days after day after day, and uh, everybody I could hear them talking around my bed. I'd be in a fog. I could hear them talking about he may not pull through, or his heart can't stand this much longer, or he's not going to make it. I heard all that, but I, and I wanted to laugh, but I didn't have the strength to, because <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to die. If you were with us the last time, we talked with Johnny Cash about the great performers he's known, past and present, trends in both country and popular music. But tonight is devoted to the Johnny Cash story alone. And where we left off, we were talking about some of the problems you've had with drugs, and eventually that led you to the Betty Ford Clinic. Yeah, it did. Um, I just like to say, same white pants. I wanted to tell the people that, uh, that you've got a first in television. 33 years in the business, first time I've ever worn white pants. You caught me unawares, you know. We made was, history. It was a, yeah, it was a hot, hot night. So, yeah, the lowest point in my life, not just career, was uh, the day. Well, I, I agree. They had a family intervention, they call it. The doctor and the family came around. We talked about my problem while I was still in the hospital in Nashville. And I was convinced that I, I knew I had a problem. And then after being on morphine, IV for pain for 12 days, I I was really hooked, really hooked. Uh, not that I wasn't before, I was. But um, I agreed to go to Betty Ford Center. But the low point of my life was the day I walked into that door. You know, you walk in and say, I can't handle it, so I'm putting my life into the hands of the professionals. That's a very humbling thing to do, you know, and it... Uh, I didn't know anything about treatment centers. I didn't know about what they had padded cells and bars on the window, but they don't. It was like a Betty Ford Center is like a country club, uh, the way it looks, of course. But mm -hmm. the program is very, very intense. And it was only that initial going into that place that was the low point. From then it was up because it was the best 43 days I ever spent in my life. That's what I did, 43 days. The program was... 30, but I stayed 43 because I got a slow start because of uh, having come out of the hospital and because uh, the business I'm in and uh, uh, and my past history, uh, I just wanted to learn all I could and I agreed to stay that length of time. The the therapy sessions and uh, the camaraderie, the program, the uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, the clergy, all of them. Um, you get a look at yourself like you'd never have any other way in the world. And if you really want to get off of uh, drugs and alcohol, if you've got a problem, that's the way to do it, a treatment center. Man, it's, I wouldn't take anything for the time I spent in there. Uh, and, and so long as I stay in that program and uh, remember those things that I was taught and make that daily commitment, every day is, uh, every day is a real blessing for me. And I, I, I would dread to... Uh, I hate to think that I'd ever have another day like that day I walked into Betty Ford Center. You've always had a very strong spiritual side. Yeah. How were you able to reconcile that with all the wild years, the boozing, the drugs? While you were in the midst of it, that spiritual side was still a part of you. Roy Orbison wrote a song called My Best Friend. Lines in the song are, a diamond is a diamond, and a stone is a stone. Man is part good and part bad. It's just that the, the uh, bad dog inside me whipped the good dog most of the time. <laughs> and I went, time. Uh, I went into Betty Ford to try to settle the dog fight. And uh, since then, the good dog's been winning. 
Um, who knows why the evil in a man gets the upper hand over the good. But the spiritual commitment, the commitment to God, the, uh, the, uh, the spiritual line I try to walk, uh, I don't. I don't know how anybody can make it without it. But it's a thin. It's a thin line to walk between those two dogs that fight for your life. And uh, um, I guess you know, with uh, close calls I've had and the things I've learned, I've learned how to hold on a little bit more as each day goes by. And as each day goes by, it's life is really, really a blessing. I'm 56 now, and. Um, I just read last week that uh, the that, uh, average life of a drug addict or alcoholic is uh, 24 years less than the uh, average person. So I beat it 10 years. I'm 56, 46, I should have died. I'm 56, and I look forward to a, a long life, hopefully. Let's shift gears here. What do you remember about your father? My father was, uh, in my mind, a great man. He was a simple country man, a cotton farmer. But he's a good man, a man of charity and compassion and tolerance. Um, he was a veteran of World War I. He, uh, he was a walking, talking piece of history. He only died three years ago. <clears throat> 1915, he was with General John J. Pershing at uh, Columbus, D D Fort Deming, New Mexico, went down to try to catch Pancho Villa after he burned Columbus, New Mexico, and he used to tell me all about that. Never about, could find him, right? No, never could find Villa, huh? <clears throat> he went back across the border and didn't come back. But my dad told some great stories about uh, his life as a young man. He was a very hard-working man. He was a hobo in the true sense of the word, in that he was a, he was a working hobo. During the Depression, he hopped freight trains all over the country. Uh, to find any kind of work he could get for any price, and he sent the money home to my mother to take care of us kids. And uh, he worked like that until he retired when he was about 65. Your mom is still living, right? Still living. What my mother is really an inspiration. She, uh, my mother works at uh, a place called House of Cash, which is my office. It's not a loan company. It's my uh, office and. <laughs> Souvenir store there at uh, Hendersonville, Tennessee. She runs the place. She's 84. And um, two months ago, she had uh, the doctor say, you got terminal cancer. You got the worst kind of the, of the bladder. And they took it out. And 10 days later, she walked out of the hospital. He said, don't go back to work for six months. I don't want you driving that car. Well, about two weeks later, she slipped off and went to the store and got her some new clothes and went back to work. And she's She's working today. She's a, she is a great inspiration to me, too. When I really want advice from somebody on any heavy thing, I go talk to my mother. We're going to stop right here and come back with Johnny Cash in just a minute on Later. Please stay with us. Rolling along with Johnny Cash, they tell me you were a door-to-door -door salesman at one time as a youngster. I was trying to be, but I, I had the worst approach as a salesman. It was when I first got out of the Air Force and I was trying to get into the music business. This is during the time I was calling Sam Phillips begging for an audition. I was knocking on doors trying to sell refrigerators and washing machines and uh, I never made a living at it. I kept getting a draw from the company which I paid back when I got my f first royalty check. But uh, I couldn't sell anything. Why do you think you couldn't? I tried to sell encyclopedias once, door to door, and I really didn't want to do it. It was a summer job That's between it. sophomore and junior years mm -hmm. in college, and I had a job in a swimming pool uh, showroom. But in August, people stopped buying swimming pools, so they fired me. So now I, had, I needed another job for a month, and a friend of mine said, hey, we'll, we'll sell these encyclopedias. And there was a girl there who was selling the encyclopedias with us, and, and we both kind of liked her, and that's the reason why we stuck around, even though he sold one set in three weeks, and I sold none. <laughs> I just couldn't bring myself to go into this long spiel and face mm -hmm. the rejection of people mm -hmm. throwing me out of their house. That's the way I was. I, I didn't want to sell anybody anything. I would walk, knock on these doors, and maybe the house didn't look too good, and the lady would come to the door in an old house dress, and I couldn't, I didn't have the heart to... to push through a sale to sell her a $500 refrigerator when it didn't look like she could afford a pair of shoes. And uh, I remember my last day on the job was trying to sell. I knocked on the last door of the day. I hadn't sold anything all day. 
And the lady came to the door, and she stood there, and I looked at her, and she waited for me to say something. I said, you don't want to buy anything, do you? And she <laughs> said, no. I said, good, bye. <laughs> that was my last door I knocked on. What about the time you were performing in front of Mamie Eisenhower? Yeah, there was uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and Gene Autry, a lot of people at the... Uh, at the Waldorf Astoria. It was a tribute to, to Mamie Eisenhower dinner back in 71. I had on this Andrew Jackson suit, these tight ski pants uh, with a strap under the, the heel. Mm -hmm. And um, I, went, I was introduced and I walked out to do a, a four song medley of train songs with my guitar on my shoulder and pick in my hand. I hit the first lick and kicked my leg out and busted my pants from my ankle to my crotch. And I looked and my bare leg hanging out and Mamie Eisenhower sitting 10 feet in front of me. And she never and had such an appreciation of old hickory up until that's that time. That's right, that's right. <laughs> 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 and I was so embarrassed. Everybody was trying not to laugh because they were so embarrassed for me. Because it was just evident I was just, I was dying. Well, I went, I put my legs together and did the train melody medley then I ran off ran up to my room up the elevator into my room jerked off those clothes and stomped them everything I had on I jerked it off and threw it on the floor cussing and screaming and hollering June walks in behind me and she sits down in a chair in the corner and she starts laughing at me and that made me matter I really got mad I said what in the hell are you laughing about and she said well Calm down just a little bit. She said, you got the number one record, A Boy Named Sue. You got a number one television show. One of the biggest record sellers in the world. Albums, everything else. Very popular person. I said, so what? What's that got to do with tonight? And she said, everything. And I said, what do you mean everything? She said, God has just busted your britches. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised by how big a hit A Boy Named Sue became? Shel Silverstein, who writes the great children's books, wrote mm -hmm. that song. Mm -hmm. Did you think it was going to zoom like it did? No, as a matter of fact, I hadn't even planned to take it to San Quentin when I left Nashville to go that day. The night before I left, Bob Dylan, uh, Shel Silverstein, Chris Christopherson, Joni Mitchell, and Graham Nash were at my house. And that night, for the first time, was sung A Boy Named Sue, me and Bobby McGee. Lay, Lady, Lay, Both Sides Now, and Mary Cash Express. Those five songs. First time anybody ever heard them. And what a Shell, jam session that must And Shell said, you go into the prison, why don't you take a boy named Sue and record it and sing it for him? And I said, I, I don't know it. I can't do it. And he left there the next morning thinking I wasn't going to, and I hadn't planned to. And June, as an afterthought as we were leaving, said, take the words to a boy named Sue. Maybe you'll just recite it for him. And that's, that's really what I did. I put it on a music stand. And uh, my band and Carl Perkins played, uh, played the rhythm. They started into a rhythm. And I told the cons, I, I said, I don't know this song, but I think you like this. And that was the one and only recording of a boy named Sue I've ever done. Well, you and, can hear them whooping it up in the background, yeah, all those cons. Yeah, oh, they did too. love it. In just a few seconds here, people do crazy things. That oh. song was a hit in the summer of 69. Did you ever hear from people who had boys born yeah. to them during that summer yeah. and foolishly named the kid Sue? I, I still do. I still do. Oh, I, I've heard from a lot of men named Sue. Matter of fact, I know a guy named Sue Cash. He's a judge in Arkansas. But is it Sue, S-I-O-U-X, like no, Sue Indians? No, S-U-E. S-U-E. Yeah. Uh, there's, that's another joke, you know. About the little Indian boy along the road said, Life ain't easy on a Sue named boy. <laughs> and, uh, and on that note, <laughs> we take this break. <laughs> By the way, the Johnny Cash exhibit runs for the next two years at the Country Music Foundation in Nashville. We thank the folks there for their help on both of these shows. What a great pleasure this has been. Thank you for being so open with us. I know the folks out there enjoyed it. I've enjoyed being with you, Bob. Johnny Cash. See you all later. Bob's guest tomorrow will be presidential grandson and son-in-law David Eisenhower.